Hello everyone, it's good to see you once again. It is Dr. Pig from Elisha's home here on Freedom Mountain. And uh, it's been another week and it's good to be back with you. And I'm so excited to uh, bring the message this evening. Uh, as you all know that we have been studying uh, discipleship to restoration and this just happens to be our 18th week and uh, we are going strong on this topic and so this evening we're going to be taking a look at the words trust commit rest and wait so if you have your bible you want to open your bible to psalms 37 and then put a little bookmark we're going to go over to psalms 73 in just a little bit and uh, I'm excited tonight um, this is a, a lead off of last week last week we talked about attitude adjustment and uh, we delved into what it is that we need to do to please God and so uh, this evening as I said we're gonna take a look at trust commitment resting in the Lord and waiting on the Lord so there's a lot of really good words that we're going to talk about this evening. And uh, we're going to be talking about pondering, one of my favorite words. And we're also going to be talking about complacency, another one of my words that seems to be uh, continually popping up the last several years. So just want to uh, encourage you to find a comfy spot, a quiet spot, and uh, to settle in before the Lord and uh, be prepared. Hope that you've had some time to prepare your spirit before we have come together and just some time for worship before we enter in. And uh, I just wanna to say to you that I'm really excited about this particular study. I don't know about you all, but from time to time, uh, I struggle to memorize things and to keep them long-term and so, I noted that this evening that we're going to be taking a look at Psalms 37. We're going to look at the first 11 verses and then we're going to pop over to Psalm 73. Notice the numbers are flipped. So for those of you that are like me that are always looking for acronyms or little um, memory boosters, uh, there's just a little one for you. All right. So like I said, we're on week 18 uh, in our series. And uh, we are taking a look at trust, commitment, rest, and waiting on the Lord. So let's just jump right into prayer, and then we'll jump right into our, our study. Heavenly Father, we thank you for yet another week. We uh, thank you, Lord, for uh, the instances in which undoubtedly we saw your fingerprint uh, on specific events and uh, just evidence Heavenly Father evidence that you were there in our midst that you were watching over us protecting us and uh, just I continue Lord to uh, stand in amazement at your creativity and how you um, organize and plan the tiny little details that you take notice, the key details that you take notice of in our life and you make sure that uh, everything is planned and organized and prepared for us so that there is nothing amiss in our lives as long as we continue uh, to walk in your footprints and uh, to follow your lead. And so Heavenly Father, I just thank you for that. I thank you for those little moments when, um, you know, that, that seem like a little gift wrapped up in a bow. You know, this week I stop and stand in amazement that as I was in the kitchen, um, you know, I, I got to watch uh, two turkeys just right outside my kitchen window, Lord. And uh, that was just amazing to watch your creatures. And so I thank you for those little moments that uh, we're reminded of your creativity and your workmanship heavenly father and we stand in awe just absolute awe of who you are and uh your magnificent 
creation. Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, for joining us this evening. We invite your Holy Spirit and we say, Holy Spirit, have your way. And uh, we open our hearts and commit our hearts and our spiritual eyes and our spiritual ears to be open, Lord, to receive um, your word this evening. And we ask, Lord, that when we uh, are finished our Bible study, Lord, that there would be things that you would yet show us throughout the week to give us a deeper, uh, a deeper meaning and application for our own personal lives. We thank you, Lord, that uh, you continue to bring the scriptures alive to us. You explain to us things that maybe we've read numerous times before, but we never really understood or never really saw the hidden mystery. And so I thank you that uh, in these quiet moments that uh, you've shown us some of these things and um, how we can apply those things to our own lives. And so, Heavenly Father, we come before you now uh, in gratitude for all that you are to us, our Heavenly Father, our Heavenly Daddy. We thank you for the love that you give us uh, from the time we rise up to the time we rise up the next morning and how your mercies are new, new every morning when we rise up. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. Heavenly Father, we commit this time now to studying your word and to uh, fellowshipping with you. In your precious name we pray, amen. So as I said just a few moments ago, if anyone has just come in, we're going to be taking a look at Psalms 37 and then we're going to take a look at Psalm 73. So we just want to put a little bookmark there and I'll try to give you a heads up. Uh, you know, a few minutes before we get to chapter 73, so that if you've not found it, that you can take a moment and uh, find it and stay with us as a group. So, taking a look now at Psalms uh, 37, uh, I want to just point out to you that this psalm was written when David was in his older years, and you can verify that in verse 25. And so we see that he's giving wisdom, uh, but his wisdom is not being given just as we're speaking here. His wisdom was given in a pattern of a song. And so as we study this out in the Hebrew, we find that it is written in an acrostic arrangement, meaning that the lines in the Hebrew sentences begin with the successive letters of the Hebrew alphabet. So this is a wisdom psalm and it's directed to man, and it's like a teaching, like what we would see in the manner of the book of Proverbs. So taking a look now at verse one and two, just to start off, we see that this particular portion of scripture is uh, focused on the counsel for the afflicted people of God. So, you know, you might ask yourself, well, what does afflicted mean? You know, usually when we think of afflicted, we think of someone who is sick uh, and physically. But to be afflicted, you can be afflicted in your spirit. You can be afflicted in your mind, meaning that you are discouraged or meaning that you are unsettled in your spirit, that you don't have a peace, that there's a wrestling going on, there's an inquiry going on. And so... Uh, as my son Sam likes to remind me, I use the word ponder quite a bit. Uh, I oftentimes, after I've done my studies, I'll, I'll sit and I'll ponder and uh, just think and ask God questions and write down questions and dig a little deeper. And so uh, it is a good thing to ponder because what it does is it helps you to organize your thoughts but it also helps you to find evidence in the word to, uh, to support uh, what God has shown you, right? Or evidence that if you are in the wrong, it gives you evidence to line yourself up, right? To get it right. So taking a look now, um, this particular two scriptures 
the message basically is not to worry about the ungodly. So basically, we see that he's pondering and he's noticing that it appears that the ungodly are just as blessed or maybe even more blessed than um, the righteous. And so this is disturbing. It's disturbing to David, but it's also disturbing to Asaph in Psalm 73. But notice that it's temporary. It's just temporary. It's just for a short period. And then remember that we're not just looking at our time here on earth. When our life here on earth finishes, we move into, we step over the threshold into glory. And so think of eternity and for how long. Um, I can't even put into words what we have to look forward to. All right, so let's take a look at verse 1 and 2. Do not fret because of evil doers, nor be envious of the workers of iniquity, for they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. Now something that I want you to just take a, uh, a thought or a ponder to would be that... Uh, you know, at some point, grass is growing, and uh, at what point is it going to be cut down? The withering of a green herb, at what point is it going to wither, right? You know that it's only temporary, but how long is it temporary? Is it a couple days? Is it a week? So stop and think and ponder about that. Do not fret because of evil doers. So basically what he's saying is, you know what, it's really common. It's common for the righteous to fret and to be envious of the wicked. And as I said before, Asaph was bothered by this also. And he commits an entire uh, psalm, Psalm 73, to his ponderings about this. And uh, we'll talk about Asaph in a little bit. But Asaph was a musical prophet. And so you can only imagine, uh, as he's pondering this, what some of his songs might have been. And, you know, we'll get to see what some of the written words were uh, when we get to that part of the study. So when we say do not fret, that means do not get upset. Don't get heated. Don't get yourself in an uproar over it. You know, take note of it, but know that it's only temporary. It's only what we see here. And then... When they pass on, and they're not passing on into glory, we all know what comes after that, right? So, moving on then to the uh, portion, they shall soon be cut down like grass. So, he gives the same answer as Asaph in um, Psalm 73. He uh, speaks to the fact that it looks as though workers of iniquity are experiencing prosperity, and that is disturbing. But remember that the green grass is only for a season, which we're all coming into. We're all going out there and having to cut the lawn. And we also see now that the herbs are coming up in the gardens, and that's only temporary. It's only temporary. They both wither. So at some point, you may not see it specifically for particular individuals, but that prosperity for the wicked, it'll wither. It'll wither one day, whether you're there to see it or not. Then in verse 3 and 4, put your trust and delight in the Lord. Now let me just say this to you. It is really difficult to put trust and delight into someone you don't know. So if you're sitting there and you're thinking, well, how am I going to do that? How am I going to put my trust and how am I going to put my delight in the Lord? Then you have to ask yourself, if you just said that, do I know the Lord well enough? And if I don't know the Lord well enough, what am I going to do about that? And we're going to talk about that a little more as we get into our study. So verse 3, trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. Verse 4, delight yourself also in the Lord and he shall give you the desires of of your heart. So instead of worrying and envying, David is counseling us as men and women of God to simply trust and do good for his glory. 
It's that simple. But let me say this. It seems really simple, but stop and think with me. Is it easy to be distracted? Do you get going and you're doing really good and then something happens and then it's an oops, you got distracted and instead of keeping your focus on what you were doing for the Lord, there was a phone call that came in and you all been there. Somebody knocks on the door and they, you know, like throw out all this whatever and you get consumed in that in staying in your proper place in delighting in the Lord and keeping your focus on your trust in Him. So, you know, all of that to say that we have to be super careful about who we have contact with, who we engage with. We have to be super careful about the things that we allow our eyes to see in the physical. And we have to be super careful about the things that we allow ourselves to hear. And then how far we let those come and settle in to our spirit. Right? So there's a conscious effort that we have to make. Right? So it might be something where, okay, you're stuck. You're stuck in the grocery line or whatever. Or you're stuck in the parking lot at the vet uh, appointment and you hear worldly people next to you. You know, and sometimes there are situations where you're just stuck. You can't walk out of it. You can't get out of it. So then you have to... Make a conscious effort to uh, focus in on the things of God and to put that aside. So you experienced it, you saw it, put it aside, lay it down. Don't focus on it, don't nurse and rehearse it. Move on and move on towards trusting and delighting in the Lord in His Word. So it is easy. It is easy to be distracted by our fleshly, what we see, what we hear, but we have to make a conscious effort, right? It is so easy to be complacent and not to be engaged in diligent effort to keep ourselves focused in the direction that we need to go. And so he reminds us to lay aside worry and envy and to enjoy what God has given us. So oftentimes I think that we don't enjoy because we don't walk through life with an attitude of gratefulness. You know, how many times uh, does Thanksgiving come and the head of the household goes around the table and asks you to give thanks for something and you sit and you struggle? Well, there's no excuse for that. You shouldn't have to sit and struggle. That should be something that you do every day. And it should be something that just comes natural to you. You should have a list on the end of your tongue. Any moment that I would walk up to you and say, Hey, what are you thankful for? What are you grateful for? So each day, I try to make it a practice to notice the little tiny details. Things that I know that I know that God put his fingerprint on. And specifically put his fingerprint on to organize, organize for my benefit. And so just as I mentioned in my prayer, um, you know, some of you might say, so it was two turkeys. You live in the mountain. Well, let me just say this to you. Two turkeys right outside the kitchen window, right smack in the yard, right smack at the time I'm doing the dishes. All right. Too many little details that were aligned and it was fascinating, absolutely fascinating. Or there will be evenings, you know, where I'm standing at the, um, the window doing the dishes and the deer are right outside. You know, there's, there's nothing like that to remind you of uh, having a grateful heart for where God has placed you to be able to see his creation, to be able to enjoy his creation. Uh, so I just want to encourage you to look at the little things, look at the small things and give God glory for those things because you'll be a much happier person. You'll be a much more content person if you can look at the beautiful little tiny details that he does just for you. And you know what? If you're a person that has not made that a practice, Every time you see those little details and you recognize that God did that just for you, how cool is that? 
You know, I can remember several years ago, and I think I probably shared this, but several years ago there had been, uh, I probably should say more than a several years ago. I don't know what the next word would be, but it's been a way back, and now I'm really dating myself. But I had a prayer uh, that I had been praying, and it was a necessity. It was urgent, and uh, I was asking God, asking God, and um, I can remember sitting on the porch and I can remember the geese flying over and it was at that moment that I received the answer to that prayer that I had been praying that was so urgent and so every time the geese fly over I am reminded of that moment when I received that answer to prayer so if I ever have a moment when I begin to doubt and I'm waiting and waiting and waiting you've all had that or you've prayed for something and you you don't hear the answer and you begin to think did he hear me yeah I heard you he heard you because you ask him a hundred thousand times he heard you but it's not time yet or maybe the answer is not the the answer that you thought he was going to give you and so you missed it when he gave it to you but you know little things like that that if you are conscious and um, you, you put that effort in to paying attention, you know, to asking God to give you an eternal perspective. You know, we're so used to walking in a, in a worldly perspective that we look through our worldly eyes instead of our eternal eyes. And so I just want to encourage you that, you know, it's the simple things. When you look at the simple things, you can see how God aligned certain things at certain times certain places exactly where you are and you know that you know that God aligned that just for you and so I want you to start to really think about that so here David is telling us that you know put your fleshly eyes away stop looking and being distracted by looking at the prosperity of the wicked and so I just want to take a moment now too and just talk to you about what prosperity. You know, some people start to squirm in their chair when they hear the word prosperity because the term prosperity has been uh, misappropriated in biblical studies often. Uh, prosperity is not for the purpose of gaining wealth or gaining uh, material things. For the purpose of self enjoyment when we read in the scriptures we see that he tells us that our barn should be full that our vat should be overflowing shaken down and overflowing so the overflow the overflow is not for us to waste but it's there for us to be like the conduit that it comes out through and we are to bless others so when we have an abundance or God gives us more than enough it is to bless others for the kingdom of God and so prosperity can mean wealth it can mean things uh, prosperity of your health both physically mentally and spiritually so if you prosper in those three areas that means that you will be well and you will be equipped and better able to carry out your calling or your destiny in the kingdom. So prosperity is to bless others. And not that you can't enjoy some of that too. But to say to you that prosperity is not about you. The focus is to be so that you can bless and do things for the kingdom. Notice he says dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. So stop worrying and stop envying, but simply enjoy in the blessings that God gives you every day. Enjoy today. Tomorrow will come. We don't need to we don't need to borrow worries from tomorrow. There'll be enough when tomorrow comes. We don't need to suck them in for today. So let's focus on enjoying the things that God does for us for today. Notice that he speaks of God being faithful. And um, if you've walked with God for very long at all, you know that he's always faithful. He always supplies. 
He's always there. He doesn't sleep. Whenever you get up in the middle of the night and you need to unburden something that's on your heart, he's there to listen. He's there to calm you, to uh, help you collect your thoughts. He's there to guide you as to what you need to do and whatever the situation is that is causing you distress. And so we need to have an attitude of gratefulness, an attitude of gratefulness. So Clark said, expect all thy happiness from him and seek it in him. So if we're seeking him first, as the scriptures say in Matthew, and he's first, we're automatically going to walk in happiness and fulfillment and content because we have banked on making him first in our life. All right, so we're deliberate, we're deliberate. If you get a chance this week, study out Acts chapter 16, verse 16 through 34. This is a, sto a story of Paul and Silas in prison. Now, there's a whole bunch of uh, situations that led to them being put into prison and a whole lot of things that they encountered that were not comfortable and so they could be sitting in there just a whining away, right? And calling the ambulance. But instead, they're uh, worshiping and praying. And so stop and think about that. That was a deliberate action on their part, right? So we praise them in the storm, and that's a deliberate. When you praise them in the storm, do you feel like praising them? Not usually, but you know what? If you make a deliberate decision, you praise them in the storm, and soon the storm clouds began, begin to lift, and the situation begins to dissolve, and he comes in, and he takes care of it, right? So, how many of us just complacently walk through our, our walk? We get up, we don't think about what God's asked us to do that doesn't even occur to us. We just get up and drink our coffee and eat our muffin or eat our bagel or whatever and then we just kind of bump through the day without going before God and asking Him, okay, what is it that you want to do today? Where do you need me to go? What do you need me to do today? Who do you need me to uh, comfort or to um, encourage today? What do you need me to do today? So we need to put concerted effort into our walk. And too often times we don't. We just kind of be bop, bump through the day. And when you get to the end of the day, you look like somebody who be bop through the day. There is nothing uh, exuberant about you. You just kind of look like you're just kind of made it through the day. Right? Kind of reminds me of that little tumbleweed that just kind of tumbles you know, it doesn't really have a specific destination. So that's where complacency will put you. So many times we're not able to trust in God. We're not able to delight in God because we don't know God. We haven't taken and made a concerted effort to spend time with him, to develop our relationship with him so that we would know that we know that we know that we can trust him. So you might be sitting there and saying, well, I don't know if I can trust him. Well, you know what? If you give him a chance, if you develop your relationship, you'll know before too long that you can trust him and you can take delight in him. If you start looking for the things and giving him credit for all those little things, that he lines up just for you. So stop and think about that. Complacency has been something that we've talked about from time to time for the last four or five years. And I think it's something that we really have to be super diligent and focused because it's real easy for that to creep up on us from time to time and just become very complacent. So and he says, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. So if you are truly delighting in the Lord, it will be an automatic that you'll have the desires of your heart because your desires will line up with his desires and you will find that you are delighted in God 
and that if you delight in God, that is the key to having a happy, satisfied life. A happy, satisfied life. So here's something that Spurgeon said about Martin Luther. It's what he said. He said, they said of Martin Luther as he walked the streets, there comes a man that can have anything of God he likes. You ask the reason of it, because Luther delighted himself in his God. Powerful, powerful thought, powerful thought. Let's take a look now at verse 5 and 6. We're going to talk about how we can trust God to protect us and to promote us. Commit your way to the Lord, trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. He shall bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. So if we're committing ourselves to him and fully trusting him, then we're going to have peace, we're going to have protection, we're going to have satisfaction, and we're going to have a surrendered focus upon God. So stop and think for a moment. Um, have you ever been at a job and you deserved a promotion and there was a person next to you who didn't really deserve it, but that person got the promotion? And then how did you focus or how did you deal with that? When you stop and think about that, I'm sure that I'm not the only one that's ever had that experience. So just a short little glib to say to you all the way back, um, my first job out of college, uh, there were two administration positions and there was a young woman about my same age who was hired in the position over me. But I noticed very early on in the first week of the work day or the work week that uh, she didn't do what she was supposed to do. And so uh, I made sure that when she wasn't looking, I went and did what she was supposed to do. And I just kept doing that. I did that for probably three months. Never said a word to anybody. Just anytime she slipped up and didn't do what we were supposed to do or what she was supposed to do, I just jumped in and I did it without saying a word. One day I got called into the office and uh, I was told that I was to pack up my office and so I was sitting there thinking okay I'm getting fired no it wasn't getting fired I was getting promoted because this other person had been fired because she didn't do what she was supposed to be doing and so I ended up being promoted and I was blessed because now I got to do her job and my job so I got to do two jobs they never hired another person because I was already doing her job so in their mind why do we need to hire another person here's this person that's already stepped up and been doing it so I laugh about it now but it was a little frustrating but a little whatever you want to call that but stop and think about that you know like God will promote you if you do the right thing he sees what you're doing. It doesn't matter if man does, but he'll orchestrate it. You'll be blessed and he'll promote you. And, you know, sometimes we we try to promote ourselves or like if we don't get promoted, we make a big fuss. And, uh, you know what, that's not very impressive. Usually it won't happen if you try to promote yourself. But if you let God take care of it, God will promote you. And the, in his time, he'll promote you. So, let's take a look then at verse 7 through 8. We're going to find rest in God because He deals with the wicked. We don't have to deal with them. He deals with them for us. So, this is what He says in verse 7 and 8. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for Him. Do not fret because of Him who prospers in His way, because of the man who brings wicked schemes to pass, Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret. It only causes harm. So notice that he uses the word patiently. How many of us can honestly sit and say, Yep, I'm super, super patient. I can sit here as long as I need to sit here. And wait for God to take care of it. No. Patiently. How many of us pray and we want something immediately? And don't sit there and shake your head and say, no, I'm not like that. Because most of us are like that, including myself. So when we talk about rest, you know, uh, we're not just uh, talking about rest where you go to sleep. We're not talking about that kind of rest. We're talking about rest that when you're in a situation 
And God wants you to just be quiet, to be silent, to cease from using words of self-defense, right? We all have that inner desire to use words to vindicate ourselves, right? But we don't necessarily need to do that. Sometimes he'll tell us just to zip it up. He'll take care of it. And sometimes we're obedient and sometimes we're not. But we need to quietly submit to his will and wait for his help. And he steps up and takes care of it for us. So cease from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret. It only causes harm. And so, you know, it's one of those things where if you're delighting yourself in the Lord, you're not going to get yourself all worked up, right? Because you're going to be patient. You're going to be calm. You're going to be self-controlled. Those are not very popular words, I'm sure. But let's take a look at verse 9 through 11. Trust that God will punish evildoers and reward the meek. For evildoers shall be cut off, but those who wait on the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. And yet a little while, and the wicked shall be no more. Indeed, you will look carefully for his place, but it shall be no more. And the meek shall inherit the earth, and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. So we can trust in his promises that he'll take care of us, not only us, but he's, he's got it all under control. He sees what's happening in the world. He's well aware. And uh, he doesn't need us to like have a panic attack or anything. He's got it. He's got it. We just need to trust him. And then to be obedient to do whatever he tells us to do. So for yet a little while and the wicked shall be no more. So you know the, the wicked that appear to be prosperous. Whether it's in good health or whether it's in things. Or whether it's in... Uh, monetary uh that like we said before that's temporary it's short-lived it's short-lived we're not looking for the short answer we're looking for the answer of eternity so our focus needs to be righteousness long term and then we have the long term unending blessing of heaven for eternity but the meek shall inherit the earth so he has repeated the idea of God's care and the reward for the meek. And so the meek, they delight themselves in the abundance of peace. So this is something that I want you to think. Um, Kidner said this, and this is a really good quote. This context gives the best possible definition of the meek. They are those who choose the way of patient faith instead of self-assertion patient faith instead of self-assertion so have you ever been in a situation where you think okay that's really wrong and that needs fixed and so you didn't hear God tell you to go take care of it or do anything you just decided your big bad self that you're going to go assert yourself into that situation and that you're going to fix it you're going to be the fixer. Yet God didn't call you to do that. Notice that he says the meek shall inherit the earth. This is um, a line that Jesus quoted in the Sermon of the Mount. The third beatitude in Matthew chapter 5 verse 5. And so we see that it's an exposition of the third beatitude. It was written a thousand years before Jesus began his public ministry. And so it gives us the character of the meek or the trusting person in the face of the apparent prosperity of the wicked. So we really want to think about that. All right, so you know what? I had promised you that before we got to uh, Psalm 73, I was going to tell you. And guess what? I forgot. So I'll give you a minute. Flip over to chapter 73. Forgive me. It slipped up on me. I got too involved in uh, making sure that I got the message across on 37, Psalm 37, and then, oops. All right, so Psalm 73, this particular portion of scripture is entitled, My Feet Almost Slipped. Now, this psalm is written by 
Asaph. And as I mentioned before, Asaph was a great singer and a musician of David and Solomon's era. And he's known as a prophet that brings his messages, um, his prophetic messages in musical compositions. And so he uses, when we look at Psalm 73, he uses a lot of dominant pronouns. All right, so pronouns are like hi, I, he, she, it, we, they, them, but the dominant ones. So we're going to go through for just a moment, English, take an English moment, a grammar moment, because I think it signifies um, and gives us perspective. So uh, when Asaph was troubled by the fate of the ungodly, in verses 1 through 12, we see that he uses the dominant pronoun, they. And then, in verses 13 through 17, he's describing his own frustrated thinking, leading to the resolution, and we see that he uses the dominant pronoun, I. And now notice in uh, verse 18 through 22, when you look down through those, we see that he uses the dominant pronoun, you, referring to in the sense of God and he's finding resolution uh, to the problem that he's speaking with God about and then uh, in verse 23 to 28 we see that he uses the dominant pronouns you and I uh, when he's proclaiming the assurance of his faith and his fellowship with God so I think it's really important sometimes to, I know a lot of people are like, eh, I don't want to look at the grammar. But, you know, sometimes if you notice little things like that, you'll begin to notice it'll give you more of an understanding of the scriptures. And it just enlightens you to be able to grab the key details that are being noted there. So taking a look, we notice that Asaph is pondering. And, uh, you know, in his pondering, his thoughts are intertangled with scripture. And so he's looking for evidence. He has what he's observed in life. And then over here he has the scriptures. And so he's trying to wield them together. And so we see that at this time he's looking at the contradiction of the goodness of God and the prosperity of the wicked. And so this is what he writes in verse 1 through 3. Truly God is good to Israel, to such as are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled. My steps had nearly slipped. For I was envious of the boastful when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. So the biblical definition, we already talked about that a little bit when we were talking in verse, or in Psalm 37, that we talk about an abundance and the reason for abundance is an overflow to be able to meet the needs of others in the kingdom and prosperity also is speaking to us about our physical our mental and our spiritual health which enables us to fulfill our destiny and our calling in the kingdom so notice he says truly god is good to israel that's a simple declaration it's something that he's noted uh, he's observed. It's something that he understands. He knows that he knows that God is good and that God has actively shown his goodness to Israel and to the pure in heart. He knows that. He's seen it. He's observed it. So you have to remember that Asaph was an organizer. He was a leader in the temple choirs in the days of David. And we can presume that he also was in the era of Solomon. So we see that he... Uh, in First Chronicles chapter 25, verse 1 and 2, he actually prophesied according to uh, the order of the king. All right? So that's just something that, you know, to put on his little protocol as to who he was. A little tidbit that helps us to know uh, what some of his roles were. So, but as for me, my feet had almost stumbled. So he knew that what he said about God in the first verse was true. And, but yet there was another truth that disturbed him greatly and he was trying to sort it through and he says it almost made me stumble it made my steps nearly slip so
So he can kind of see himself. He knows I'm in trouble. I'm on shaky ground. I need to get this solved. I need to figure this out. For I was envious of the boastful when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. And so this was another truth that seemed to contradict what Asaph knew of God that was declared in the very first verse. So he knew that God was good to Israel and he knew that he was good to the pure in heart. But it seemed to him that God was also uh, good to the wicked. And in Asaph's mind, this seemed unfair and it made him almost stumble and slip. So this was troubling evidence to him and he needed to sort it through. So, um, hmm, in John chapter 9, verse 2, uh, it refers to uh, Job's friends and uh, who sinned this man or his parents that he was born blind. This was what the disciples were asking. Just as we, when we read the book of Job, we see all of the questioning there as to if he's such a righteous man, why did this happen to him? You all have those questions. Don't sit there and act like you're all pompous and you're all that and that you don't ever question God's ways. Don't even go there with me because I know you're lying. We all sometimes see things and we sit and think, hmm, how does that line up? Why did that happen? And it's not that you're trying to put anything over on God. You're just trying to figure out your understanding because what you're seeing in your physical eye might not line up with what your spirit knows. And so you're trying to figure that out. And so sometimes it's about putting it together so that the hand and the glove fit. All right. So this is what Boy says. He says, if God is in control of things, the plans of the wicked should flounder. They should even be punished openly. The godly alone should prosper. But that is not what Asaph saw, and it is not what we see either. We see scoundrels, scoundrels getting rich, utterly degenerate persons, like particularly vile rock musicians, movie stars, are well paid and sought after. Even criminals get rich selling their crime stories. All right? So, now you begin to see what we're talking about. We've got what's presented in the Word, and then we've got what we notice. But then we have to remember that, you know what? After the end, then we're moving into eternity. So that all has to be part of what we consider. Taking a look now at verse 4 through 9. The good life of the wicked is what this portion is entitled. For there are no pangs in their death, but their strength is firm. They are not in trouble as other men, nor are they plagued like other men. Therefore, pride serves as their necklace. Violence covers them like a garment. Their eyes bulge with abundance. They have more than heart could wish. They scoff and speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak loftily, they set their mouth against the heavens, and their tongue walks through the earth. So, there's no pangs in their death, meaning that the wicked people seem to die peaceful deaths, while the righteous seem to have horrific deaths. They are not in trouble as other men, nor are they plagued as other men. So, here he's developing his argument even further. He's saying that the wicked are uh, rewarded equally to the righteous. They, in fact, sometimes seem to be more blessed than the pure in heart, and their lives seem to be less trouble, and they're not as plagued as the average man. He also notes, therefore, pride serves as their necklace. So here he, in his analysis, he feels as though God is not punishing the wicked as he should, and that... They, uh, because they're not being punished, they simply become more wicked and their pride becomes more prominent as their necklace and they become more violent, more greedy, and more likely to scoff and blaspheme. Those are his observations. So, uh, he goes on and he speaks to it some more. And this is what he says in verse 10 through 14. The doubts of the godly. 
Therefore, people return here, and waters of a full cup are drained by them, and they say, How does God know? And is there knowledge in the Most High? Behold, there are the ungodly, who are always at ease. They increase in riches. Surely I have cleansed my heart in vain, washed my hands in innocence. For all day long I have been plagued and chastened every morning. So, let's look at this. Therefore, as people return here, so the wicked man, he has associates that are just like him. They take uh, and take just like he does. So it's not like it's just one person. And so stop and think about this. In our world today, is it possible that we have uh, a popular worship of success? So if we weren't having a Bible study and I walked up to you and said, Hey, well, how would you define success? Stop and think about that. Think about what you would say and then be really honest with you, yourself and say, in our society, do we have a worship? Do we have a worship of modern day success? Do we err on that side of looking at people who are successful according to our worldly definition? All right. Now, Take a moment and think about what your definition, your biblical definition of success is. That would be two totally different definitions, right? Two totally different definitions, right? Then he says, and they say, how does God know? So he's told that the wicked man sets his mouth against heaven and that the wicked man and his associates say things against heaven. They claim that God is blind or that he's ignorant and they seem to do as they please and God is unable notice he says unable to do anything against them and so then behold these are the ungodly so in frustration he's taking note of the ungodly lives that are being lived and how it looks like a good life as to what it's reaping right and so he thinks that it looks like a life of ease. It looks like a life with an increase of riches and that the wicked are being rewarded and that it appears that God seems to be unknowing as to what the wicked are saying about him. And so he's frustrated and he goes on and he's trying to vindicate himself before the Lord and he says, surely I've cleansed my heart in vain. Meaning, God, I cleanse my heart and you didn't even notice. Right? That's what he's saying. He's frustrated. So, for all the day long I've been plagued and chastened every morning. So, he felt that his life was more difficult than the life of an ungodly man. He's noticing that the wicked men are enjoying their life with wealth and ease and pride. And he feels plagued and chastened every morning. And he has to endure this all day long. And then every morning he feels as though he's being chastened, right? So to be plagued, that's one thing that's really bad. But to feel as though you're being chastened, that's even worse. And he implies that God himself was afflicting him with difficulties. And so he, what? When we get into that woe is me kind of thing, we exaggerate. Come on. Admit it, we exaggerate. A little bit, a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more, right? So the life of the wicked was not as good as he observed, nor was his life as bad as he felt it to be. So he was not being rational. He was in a mode where he was frustrated. So, you know, the little fishing story. Go get a fish this big, and after a couple days, it's like this big, right? It happens. It happens. All right. So the problem is understood in verse 15 through 17. And we see the power of a new perspective, a new vantage point. This is the crux of our lesson. Make sure you get this. Verse 15. If I had said, I will speak thus. Behold, I would have been untrue to the generation of your children. When I thought how to understand this, it was too painful for me until, until I went into the sanctuary of God. Then I understood their end. Now notice, 
If I had said, I will speak thus. So he caught himself sliding further and further into despair over what he perceived as prosperity of the wicked. And so he didn't want to promote this sense of injustice and despair that he felt. So he knew he needed to dig into the scripture and get a grip, right? So he says, when I thought I had to understand this, it was too painful for me. So he felt like he was caught in a trap. He felt like he was caught in a trap, couldn't get out. And so what does he do? What does he do? He decides, ha ha, I'm going to go to the sanctuary of God. And so the crisis had built and built and built until he went to the house of the Lord. And there, while he was there in worship and prayer, he received perspective on his problem like he never had before. And he was able to see from an eternal viewpoint. And then he understood the end for the wicked. Right? Now I want you to stop and think with me. How many times have we been in a situation and we're looking, 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 can't figure it out. We've danced around it, gone around it. And we're stuck. We're stuck. We don't have an answer. Don't have clear perspective. Don't have godly perspective. And then you meander into church. Go into praise. Go into worship. And when you come out of praise and worship after some prayer, you have a whole new perspective. And when you walk out the back side of the church, what? You had a revelation. You had a revelation. And that's not to say that that's the only place that you could have a revelation. But it is to say, that, you know, uh, we've been in an unprecedented extended period of time where many people have not ventured to come inside the, the doors of the church because they've been frightened of the virus. And, you know, the CDC and all of that, do this, don't do this, do that, do this. And every day it's something different because they don't know. They don't know. In all honesty, they don't know. And so we listen to that. And so what does it do? It puts fear on us. And then in fear, we don't come to the house of the Lord. And so we all know that, you know what? You can sit at home and get the message, sure. But it's not the same as when you come and you have fellowship, right? So a prolonged period of not coming into fellowship with like-mindedness, that's not of God. You know, we all had to do it for a period because of safety. But now we're starting to come out on the other side. And so it was very easy just to sit in front of your little screen and, you know, sit there with your little PJs and your hot chocolate with your big old marshmallows slurping on your hot chocolate while you were getting the word. But now we're coming out on the other side and we need to be putting concerted effort to making sure that we get back to the house of the Lord so that we have that possibility of getting refreshed in fellowship. But at the same time, there's a renewing that takes place when we come each week and we engage in worship and praise and prayer in a united body. So this is something that I want you to really think about. I'm not trying to point fingers. I'm not trying to be negative uh, trust me I'm not I just want to say to you that you know what this is where we're, we're coming out now hopefully hopefully so we need to really be praying about that as to we need to get back to the house of the Lord and yes take our precautions we still wear our masks or whatever but we need to get back to worshiping together we need to get back all right so that we don't have that clouded um, that clouded perspective. We need a new perspective. So by prayer and worship in the sanctuary, he understood that God was at the center of all things. He had a new, renewed appreciation for God and for God's eternity. And the crisis lifted from him. And he now was coming into a refreshed because he had an internal viewpoint, I refreshed trust in God. 
And so all of that to say, then in verse 18 through 20, we see that he speaks of an unsafe place for the wicked. And so he says, surely you set them in slippery places. You cast them down to destruction. Oh, how they brought to desolation as in a moment. They are utterly consumed with terrors as a dream when one awakes. So, Lord, when you awake, you shall despise their image. And so you can see, he's starting to see that, ah, they're the ones that are in the slippery spots. And they're going to start to slip, 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 slip. And so, um, moving on down to verse 21 through 24, we see that uh, he speaks of confessing foolishness and receiving guidance. Thus my heart was grieved, and I was vexed in my mind. I was so foolish and ignorant. I was like a beast before you. Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold me by my right hand. You will guide me with your counsel, and afterward receive me to glory. Notice that he says, you will guide me with your counsel, and afterward receive me to glory. So he's expecting God to guide him. He's expecting God to give him counsel. He's expecting to hear God's wisdom, and he's, re he's expecting God's guidance. He's looking for it. He's looking for it, a concerted effort. He's looking for it. And so he has a faithful expectation of guidance all the way through his life, and then realizing that he will cross over the threshold into glory uh, for eternity. And verse 25 to 28, we see the glory of the heavenly hope. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is none upon earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For indeed, those who are far from you shall perish. You have destroyed all those who desert you from for harlotry, but it is good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust in the Lord God that I may declare all your works. So this is an expression, a longing expression, a beautiful expression of his heart uh, and his um, longing for eternity. And so he says, there is none upon earth that I desire besides you. And so, um, you know, he's just, he's looking at God as his inheritance in heaven and recognizes that this is an earthly inhabitant for now. And uh, he's looking forward without doubt. And so, you know, he went to the sanctuary and he received an eternal viewpoint. How many times do we go through something in life where, yeah, it really does. In the flesh, it doesn't look right. It doesn't fit right. It doesn't, there's no way to align the puzzle pieces. And then we go, we have fellowship in the sanctuary, we worship, we pray together, and voila, we have revelation, and we can see clearly now, right? So we really need to pray about that. Great, so let's go to the Lord with a word of prayer, and then we'll close. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, and we thank you, Lord, that in those seasons when we become weary and um, discouraged and experience despair, we thank you, Heavenly Father, that you lovingly are patient with us and you guide us and you turn us around, you take us to the sanctuary and um, you just you spend time with us and uh, you allow us to walk through that time of worship and that our spirits are cleansed. We thank you, Lord, that you love us. You love us even in those moments that we are discouraged and confused and um, just want to give up. Just want to give up at times. And so, Lord, we thank you that Asaph was so willing to be honest, even in his position. Um, he wasn't high and lofty, but he was real. He was transparent as to what he was struggling with. And so, Heavenly Father, we thank you that you've put some of those um, sincere experiences in the Word so that when we look at that, we can see, you know, sometimes 
it's normal, but this is what we need to do to get back on the right track and for our, our minds to be healthy and our spirits to be healthy. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that um, things are beginning to lift so that we can come back as a family of God and feel safe to once again worship uh, in your sanctuary. We thank you, Lord, uh, for meeting us there and for giving us an eternal viewpoint. We thank you for all the little details, Lord, that you take care of just to, um, just to amuse us, just to amuse us. We thank you that you love us that much, and uh, we just want to um, say that we're sorry for those times that you put forth great effort to align things, and, and we don't give you credit for it, and so we repent for that, Heavenly Father, and um, we sincerely desire to take note, to put a concerted effort to take note, to thank you. And to be more grateful for the things that you do for us. Heavenly Father, we love you. And uh, we're looking forward to studying your word more this week. And uh, we're looking forward to guiding us and directing us in that. And so, we love you. And uh, we look to honor you and to serve you. And uh, just to enjoy your presence. In your precious name we pray. Amen. Well, it is time for me to say goodbye and um, wish that you are blessed this week. Look forward to seeing you soon again and uh, take care. Take care.